Good afternoon. Good afternoon again to those who were at the previous session and have to endure me a second time. Um, so I'm going to skip my presentation. Welcome to uh, the model validation uh, panel. And um, before we get into it, let me uh, let me introduce. Well, actually, let me let the panelists introduce themselves. Easier that <laughs> way. I don't have to. Uh, remember everything David has done and others have done. Uh, so go ahead, let's start with you, David. Sure. Yeah, hi, David Palmer from the Federal Reserve Board. I'm in the Division of Supervision and Regulation. I've been there for her decades, um, quite a while. <laughs> um, but I've worked on a number of things. Uh, was uh, One of my favorites is model risk management. It was one of the authors of the model risk management guidance that came out in 2011. And, but I've also worked on other things, capital, uh, more recently, third-party risk management, uh, the guidance that came out last year. So, um, you know, have my fingers in lots of pies, as they say, but I like that. And it's fun to see when things uh, sort of uh, have synthesis among them. So thanks very much for the invitation. And we have a, gr a great panelist here, so I'm really excited for the chat. Thank you, David. It's always fun sitting next to David. Uh, many of people in this room owe deeply to David. He's the father of uh, SR117 and model risk management. So my occupation the last 10 plus years was created by him. <laughs> so do many of your occupation in this room. Uh, uh, my name is Aku Sujianto. I'm the head of model risk for Wells Fargo. Still until today, by the end of the month, I will be a free person. I will be retiring. So. <laughs> End of an era. <laughs> yeah. Hi, everyone. So I'm actually a model builder. So I create all those models that all of you have to manage the risk for. I'm at Virtu Financial. Um, I started out my career in big data, data science about five or six years ago. Our group has already been producing standard econometric models that are covered under the existing regulation, but we moved heavily into ML and AI base tools. Um, I'm really excited to kind of hear what everyone is saying they need from model builders, because that's you know important for me to hear. And I'm going to hopefully give you perspective as to what we're trying to proactively provide out, especially around our ML and AI models so that everyone can use them effectively and efficiently. Good. And um, so I'm Evan Segers, and I, I, I just realized that, you know, uh, a bunch of you were not in the other session, so I, I do owe you a quick intro, <laughs> just in case. So Evan Seiker is right now, I, I'm in the exact opposite boat of, uh, of Agus's. Uh, I'm a free agent until Friday, uh, and then I have to go back and uh, actually work. Starting Monday morning at, uh, they, <laughs> they just texted me that it's gonna be 7.45 a.m. <laughs> as opposed to nine, uh, whatever. Uh, it is what it is. Uh, <laughs> um, I, my, I've been for about 20 years in, in the operational risk, non-financial risk space, actually. That's where I, I met David in my early days when I was at the Fed. Uh, I was there until uh, 2013 and then uh, left the Fed, moved into a few um, consulting roles, always in the non-financial risk space, and then landed uh, in model validation at PNC, and after that, as the head of non-financial risk for MEFG, and then uh, as of Monday, somewhere else. Um, so, uh, with the, those introductions out of the way, um, let, let's get started with the panel. Um, and we did prepare, uh, but we do, I mean, this is like herding cats, especially with uh, those two. Uh, <laughs> I felt like I was really available. Erin <laughs> is much more, yeah. she's a modeler. So, well, although Agus is an engineer, so he's also very uh, linear. But uh, I'm going to try to manage this in a very flexible way. Uh, so we can, you know, we'll, I'll try to set the stage and then we'll uh, try to stick to some of our points and see how close we can uh, <laughs> stay to them. Good. Um, so the tie, I mean, the, the starting point really ties back for those of you who were in, in the previous session, you know, uh, AI is becoming uh, a big issue uh, at, at most banks, I'm repeating uh, what's been said that probably uh, 2000 times today. Um, from a model risk perspective, it's really raising a 
a number of new problems. And, and I like to bucket it in two broad categories. Uh, you know, one that is the uh, more of a governance issue, and then two, a second category, which is a category that's more on the validation side and, and a more uh, technical side, uh, from a more technical perspective. So the, the way I, I try to think of it is there are all the traditional models, and by that I mean the forecasting models, which SR11.7 really was written for, right? Because at the time, 10 plus years ago, that was the, those were the bulk of the models that we had to use, and that, those were the, the risks we were trying to manage. And uh, we're not gonna debate how many angels dance on a pin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that's not the thing. I agree with the, you know, your view, which is that you know, there's a simple definition of a model. You know, do we use data? Are we making assumptions? Is there some kind of processing engine? And do we have uncertain forecasts, right? You have those elements, you have a model. Um, but you know, while originally models were this very well-defined set of objects, now that definition applies to a, very, a much larger number of items that, that have to be, whose, which risks have to be managed at banks. And that poses new challenges uh, for MRM and model risk and risk management in general. Uh, and going back to a point that David was making earlier, it doesn't mean that because it's a model that it, they all have to be managed the same way. And so part of the conversation will go there. So we have one bucket of items which are what I would call our traditional models, forecasting models, and how does AI change val the validation of these models, right? So think of credit models, market risk models, CCAR models, whatever you want. The models that are in your inventory now and you're slowly, slowly starting to adopt um, ML techniques. And so you, this raises a bunch of new problems for model validation, and we, we will talk about that. But then there's a whole new category of problems, which is the second big bucket, which is AIML now allows you to use models in completely novel areas of your bank, areas where models were not you know, you, you could not be considered in the past because of the type of data you had. And, and I think mostly of unstructured data and the ability of AI ML models to process unstructured data. So you will have this proliferation of models at banks, but in areas where it, it's, you, it's a completely novel use of models and where models might not be doing the same tasks, quote unquote, as they were doing in the more traditional space, which is, um, you know, forecasting or you know, strategic decision support. They might be there to help you automate tasks. So they might be there in a support function. And so now that creates a whole new set of problems, which is what do we do with these models? You know, do we validate them the same way? Or do we have to come up with different uh, ways of validating them? Or, you know, and Agus has some interesting thoughts on that. We'll get to that. So, those are the two big buckets, and you know, I, I, I would like to, for us to basically touch uh, on both. Uh, and so I thought that maybe we start at the higher level, which is you know, what falls in each bucket, and maybe you know, quickly talk organizationally what we can do with all these models that are the new type, the new crop of models, and then we'll come back to ML models that are, you know, that are coming and replacing the more traditional econometric models and talk about all the issues for, of bias, uh, explainability, and such. Good. And so with that, um, my first question, well, it's easy, I'll go with David, uh, which, which is, you know, how do you think about this problem of uh, the new models and, uh, and how, institutions should organize themselves uh, to tackle that problem. Yeah, thanks. Uh, obviously, super interesting topic, which is why I always jump at the chance to talk at events like this, because uh, it's an intellectually stimulating discussion for me, but also I learn a lot from not just from panelists, but 
um, you know, talking to, to others here. So thank you for that. Uh, I think what, what we, first of all, we're really trying to avoid being kind of dogmatic about these things, or as Evan said, sort of, um, you know, we have a general definition of model in our model risk management guidance. If it, you know, if we talk to institutions and, you know, they have a definition that's similar to that and they have something in their organization that generally meets that definition, we will ask the question, well, and they don't call it a model. We will say, well, why is that? Why is that the case? And several years ago, we did have some instances where um, a couple of institutions decided to put a different label on things that were clearly models because they... Um, it got a lighter, those got a lighter touch. And we called that out and we said, you know, all else equal, um, they should get similar treatment, whether you call them this or call them that. But if it's a way, if it's a sort of form of definitional arbitrage, that's a concern. But generally we try to take a flexible approach and say, uh, you know, firms can have slightly different definitions of what's models. To Evan's point, very importantly, um, even if something is called a model, they can, uh, address it or have different types of risk management controls, um, you know, customized to their own organization. So we try not to say, um, you know, these things have to be models. And I think AI is a great case. We have not said definitively all AI are models. Uh, the extreme case that I often use is we know that in some cases in uh, banks' um, buildings, they have elevators that use AI to make the elevators more efficient. Am I gonna say those have to be put through the MRM program? No, but I hope there's some controls over them so people don't get stuck in elevators, so there aren't elevator accidents, and that they actually you know, go to the right floors. So that's sort of an example of how we can be flexible of you know, having risk management controls over something, but you don't necessarily have to put it in your um, model risk management framework, or even if it is in your model risk management framework, you can have different approaches to it. We've seen some uh, organizations have a slightly narrower definition or, or have a um, sort of a narrower approach to the purely kind of statistical, you know, quantitative models. Then they have a different part of their MRM uh, program that's devoted to qualitative models. So they're still producing quantitative output, but a lot of what's going on in terms of the processing is more qualitative in nature. Again, what we want to just confirm is that there are um, you know, the proper risk management controls in place. When it comes to AI, these are things you know, we're talking about, we're having a good conversation with industry about, are, you know, what are some of the particular factors that drive um, AI validation um, validation even in the pure MRM sense or validation in the broader sense or independent review. Um, and so things like uh, data governance, um, things like uh, making assessments of the output, um, you know, being able to assess performance, um, looking at whether there is consistency, um, robustness, whether these things actually translate from the training environment to the real world and so forth. And I'm sure my colleagues will, uh, fellow panelists will talk about these in a little bit more detail, but that's sort of the general approach that we're trying to lay out. And we're seeing, at least so far, that most of our supervised institutions are putting most of their AI approaches into their MRM framework. Uh, one, because I think it's kind of convenient for them, for them. They have these frameworks already in place. But I think they're also seeing that a number of the principles from their frameworks, a number of the factors they look at in those frameworks have applicability to AI, even if they look at them slightly differently. Mm -hmm. So I'll stop there. That's sort of an overview of how we're approaching the issue. Agus? Yeah. Uh, for, uh, probably I'm going to divide it into two parts. The predictive AI that we know very, very well that we have used it for quite some time, particularly on tabular data. We know how to deal with that. About a couple of years ago, myself and my team released a tool called PyML. Uh, that's how you get explainability, some of them exact explainability, and testing for many, many different aspects. So that's predictive AI, particularly for tabular data, is, uh, I would consider it a solved issue. We know how to deal with it. 
And then the next part is what we I want to focus is on large language model and generative AI and how do we look at this. Uh, I'll start with large language model because how do we use large language model today? We use it for uh, text classification, complaint routing, monitoring of traders' behavior, and all of those things. Or we use it as information retrieval, asking questions to retrieve information, so very, uh, very nice productivity tool, or retrieving information plus summarization, what known today as retrieval augmented generation, and uh, general question and answer. So if you look at all this, particularly the, uh, the generative AI today, is no more than predicting the next word, is autoregressive model. If you have autoregressive model, you will validate it. Every autoregressive model in tabular data, you will validate that. So in you have now, it's the same, the same uh, concept of autoregressive predicting the next word through complicated feature engineering because you have transformer layer, you have variable complicated variable transformation through transformer, and then you do autoregressive model. If you validate autoregress, simple autoregressive model on time series tabular data, you should validate the autoregressive model on language model too because the danger of this, it can be very dangerous, for example, we use it in the banking center to assist banking center to answer customer question. And, and this model known as like any autoregressive model, the longer to predict, the uncertainty will be bigger. Same thing, we call it hallucination, right? But exactly the same thing. So the danger, you, the, the person can get wrong information and providing wrong information to customer. Suddenly you're dealing with you that problem. So that kind of risk is are in there. So we have to validate it. And then when we say validate it, what does that mean? I think David wrote very, very masterful document in SR117, talk about conceptual soundness and outcome analysis. Yes, we have to look at out, uh, conceptual soundness and outcome analysis too. There are some unfortunate things because we have to, most people use foundational model, which conceptual soundness can be questionable in terms of, because when we talk about conceptual soundness in tabular data, we talk about the, uh, the data suitability, data quality and suitability, which language model have the same issue. We have variable selection in the uh, tabular data. We call, in, in, in language model, we have prom engineering, which is the same thing, it's, it's input that we need to validate. We need to have explainability, explaining input and output, which in language model we can do it too because every information translated to embedding, embedding in uh, representation and we can look at the embedding of the answer, embedding of the prompt, how they relate so we can understand an input and output relationship too. Then we do benchmarking. Yes, we do benchmarking too on language model. So conceptual soundness that applicable for predictive AI, it will be applicable for, for language model too. And then outcome analysis, same thing in outcome analysis. We're looking at it, what condition the model is weaker. We're looking at the weak spot, weak condition when the model performance is less. So we do the same thing in what cluster of information or prompt that the model will perform less. We look at the reliability, prediction uncertainty. And this model, particularly large language model, is notorious in terms of prediction uncertainty. You give prompt, the same prompt, you get different answer. You get the same problem, you get different answer. So it's very notorious on the, on the prediction uncertainty. If you look at the, uh, under the hood, look at the, uh, the probability of predicting the next word, it varies a lot. And you look at the, uh, the embedding, it varies a lot. So prediction uncertainty is humongous problem in the uh, LLM. Then we talk about robustness, it's the same thing. Uh, uh, well, how sensitive the model to small perturbation in the input. Language model is very notorious. You change it a little bit, the answer can be very different. Yes, you have to test for robustness. And then we talk about test for under how the model is going to perform under distribution shift. Yes, people use language model different, asking different questions, so it has distribution shift that need to be tested as well. And uh, uh, those are the same element that we have to test. So the principles are the same, the techniques 
will be different, the matrix will be different instead of uh, the, the, uh, the, for, for information retrieval, matrix very similar, summarization will be different, you have hallucination, toxicity, and all of this, the matrix will be different. But all the step, the principle are the same. So that's, uh, and, and for me, it's a bit appalling today, honestly, when, when somebody have a software, you will always test your software before you deploy. Now you have Gen AI, you don't even test it. And this is a lot more complicated than software because it has stochastic nature and all those things. So testing, like testing software is not enough. You have to really test the model. So that's the, uh, the, 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 the thing that we, 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 we're dealing with today. Uh, suddenly, we, people just do the uh, Gen AI without any testing and deploy it. Even the big company, the, uh, the hyperscaler, like Google Misstep. So, so that's kind of things that, uh, that, that I'm, 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 I'm concerned about. And I think as a community, we need to up our skill to understand how to validate this model. Uh, and before I pass it on to Aaron, just a quick question on that, because these are models that are not part of the core competencies that you will find at a financial institution in the modeling space, right? That's uh, not true. If Necess not necessarily, well, it, it's becoming less and less true. So we're building up that community, but th there is really the question of um, third parties, which we were discussing earlier, which is when the model, the, the gen AI model is not in house, is not built in house and it's a, a vendor model, you, you might not, and oftentimes you will not have access to the, the model itself in order to be able to do that kind of, of validation. Uh, what do you do in that case? Because yeah. you still need to ensure, you, you want to use a service. Right. I think it's the same thing. We deal with vendor model all the time today. Right. And we know how to validate vendor model today. Yes, we're not going to know what's the inner detail and all of those things. But we can still test. We can still do benchmarking. We can still test for model weakness. We can still test for robustness. We can still test for reliability or model uncertainty. And we can still test for distribution shape. Just like we're dealing with vendor model, we may not be able to go detail on the conceptual soundness, but we can still do testing mm -hmm. and reliance, uh, rely a lot more on that. But most of the model, even in the uh, third party, they may, they may even get provide the embedding information. So like OpenAI and all those things give embedding information. It's also give the probability of predicting the next word that you can get the information and you can test it. Sometimes it's completely, your vendor probably completely not sharing with that, but you can still do all those outcome analysis testing and relying on the outcome analysis. So it's a higher reliance on outcome analysis rather than conceptual soundness. Right. Yeah, and I'll just add briefly, I definitely want to let Aaron get in is I would just add there may also be cases, you know, if you're using this in uh, a more material capacity, then you might also want to apply compensating controls for the fact that you haven't been able to maybe do that full conceptual soundness assessment. That's not unique to Gen AI, as mm -hmm. you said, that's a, a, a vendor related problem for all kinds of models. So mm -hmm. that's a good sort of natural instinct that we try to engender that if you aren't able to do that full conceptual soundness assessment, you maybe put more focus on other things like testing, but you also might consider some additional guardrails if you're using it for something more important. Good. Aaron? Yeah, so as a, um, as a model builder, I don't differentiate. Everything that I build that is basically trained off of data and is predicting is a model. I call them models. I will call them when you come in, because I'm a vendor. Some of you might consume models from me. I, I call them a model. And so the, the big, there's a couple of big differences though in application between a traditional econometric model and an ML and AI model. The first is the scale of the prediction. So we have an econometric model that's been out there for 20 plus years. And its goal is to predict uh, market impact of a, of a trait, 
many of you might use it in portfolio analysis. It's used in trading. It's used in a lot of places. It falls under everyone's <laughs> SR117. We have documentation for it. Um, the big difference between that model and the ML model I'm building today is the scale that we will predict off of. So that's an econometric model. It's structural. It does have a calibration component to it. But I will give you a prediction off of a 1,000% MDV stock traded in the Philippines. No one has traded that. I will still give you a prediction, though, for that. In the ML and AI models that I'm building, we highly cap that, that uh, scale of, of prediction. So I have another model that's doing the exact same thing, except I have built that using an ML approach off of the data that I have in my observed peer universe, off of my observed trade universe. And that I've, I've said, you can only call this for this type of trade, trade it here. So I've grossly restricted the amount of prediction that I'm going to force that model to do. So in my head, as a model consumer, you can do the same thing, right? So the econometric model was built to basically scale in a lot of cases off of data it hasn't seen. ML and AI does not have that same structural form. It is not as good <laughs> at predicting off of data it hasn't seen. It's exceptional when you have a good training set at making predictions, it's fantastic, but it's not as good as doing those predictions. So when we go out to people, we say use case matters. We think you should only use it in here. In our APIs, we will actually cap you. We will not give you predictions and we will say we do not provide predictions in this space. So I hope that that helps some of you model consumers in this space. Um, but for us, every Every model is a model. We are happy to provide transparency. I am a, a vendor, right? So we get asked questions on everything. One thing in the ML and AI space, because we actually haven't gotten asked for the same documentation around our ML and AI models that we have for that econometric model that's been out there for ages. So one of the things that we've done proactively to hopefully help the community ask bigger, bigger picture questions is we publish the data that we've used, but most importantly, the data we wish we had, but didn't have. For ML, that's really, really important. All models have bias in them. That, that's just inherent. You need to understand what that bias is. And a lot of cases as a model builder, I'm like, gosh, my model would be that much better if I had access to this. I will give you a prediction in Asia, for example, but my Asia universe is pretty underrepresented. I'm going to let you know upfront, hey, if I had more Asia data, this model would be better in Asia. Um, we will tell you the features, so the inputs that go into our model, and then the features that we actively excluded. We have a lot of endogenous um, features, so we will say, hey, we actively kicked this out, we think it's too, you know, X, Y, Z, and we excluded it, and then we will also tell you the, the model algorithm that we, we used. We, because we are a vendor of models, will err to the more transparent models, so we actively kind of avoid neural nets, they, for a lot of our stuff, only give us slight accuracy boost, and they are the black box of all black boxes. So if I'm trying to convince you to buy a model from me, right, and I say, I can give you a model, and I can tell you everything that went into it and exactly what drove the output, or I can give you a model and I can't explain anything about it, this one is probably the one <laughs> that you're going to do. And when it comes down to, you know, I think the LLMs, like, again, I love how you explained everything in, in my head in the ML and AI space is just a probability of prediction. That's it. And, and I love how you explained LLMs. They are literally, that's all they're doing is just giving you the word that they think has the best probability in, in kind of what you had prompted in or what you're asking. Um, so in that space too, you know, thinking about, I think, um, defining it to a use case, a, a specific use case can help manage the, the risk there. Right. Um, if, yes. I just wanted to actually to let you know, please feel free to either ask questions or text me questions here, but uh, let's go to the questions. Uh, there was one, well, let's start and then we'll take the one. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I love the analogy to ARIMA or autoregressive or time series models. So, because these models have been used quite a bit in econometrics for ages, and often enough, um, they help you to sort of extrapolate, right, out of the data that is essentially self-learning. Sometimes it's using a price to predict the next price or the next word, and we didn't really, you can really uh, test them 
but often enough is going to be very much depend on the journey forward and journey back, right? Uh, we've done that actually uh, with models with the surprise, uh, uh, surprise into the autoregressive, auto meaning a giant sleeping, you know, uh, creature waking up. So you can actually even add to those, make them probabilistically less predictive, if you want to call it. So how come that is not really used so much um, in the financial world? Or is that just too, you know, that's just for traders and, and things like that. It's just not adopted by the bank elsewhere? Uh, adopting the uh, language model to predict? or an, an, uh, adopting neural net structure, deep learning to predict? No, the, the same approach you calibrate or you understand or you explain your autoregressive model. Right. Right? Um, whatever it is, if you wanted to, uh, for example, regime uh, changing models, mm -hmm. like, you know, uh, going from pre-2008 uh, right. to post uh, right. pre-COVID to post-COVID. Uh, those are in the financial Model prediction guys, you know, we've, we've been doing this for 30, 40 years. Right. You know, yeah. Understanding that, you know, if you're using black trolls, black trolls is not going to capture everything, it's just a calibration tool. Mm -hmm. So the traders use these things as an input, not as a, uh, as a prescription. Right. right? So, yeah, the, on, on the language model, is the similar concept. You right. have the concept of domain generalization, basically, it's a completely shift completely because typically we do a zero shot learning we take a foundation model then yeah. i'm going to apply to my area for a specific area that model may never seen it before so that's a completely different regime so we have to test it because it may not be good at all to to do that so yes the test in term of i, I call it distribution shift is basically regime change so how the model will perform under under that environment so yes you have to test it because the uh, is is the zero shot going to uh, going to work or do we need to fine tune? We 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 for example, even the the most popular use today retrieval augmented generation just to retrieve the information and then to summarize. But if it's your document that you're trying to retrieve is not on the training data set, it's completely different things. And I uh, asking question, it will yes, it will retrieve because it will retrieve is on closest distance. It retrieved the wrong thing. <laughs> Did you check it? And then if you retrieve the wrong things and then sign it to large language model to summarize, they did it summarize well. Even the information can retrieve correctly. The language model, because of the autoregressive, it will still hallucinate. It will still draw, possibly draw wrong summary. So those kind of thing has to be tested. And then when I spoke about Let's test it under different distribution shift. Under if the customer, if the user used a uh, question for certain domain, will it work? So yes, we have to change for, we have to test for distribution shift or test for that. Test the robustness. This is, this is notorious in machine learning, any machine learning, because any machine learning is overly parameterized. You're not talking about a few parameters. You're talking about thousand in this, in this language model, talking about billion and trillion parameter. So you have more parameter than your data. That's given in machine learning. You have more parameter than the data. So the model will overfit. When the model overfit, what happened? With slight small perturbation on the input, you change the word, you change something, it will go off tangent. So that's just the nature of overfit model. And any machine learning, even XGBoost, the traditional one that use all of them overfit, you just don't detect it. You can detect it, you can test, test it by applying noise robustness here, you see suddenly, this is why we see a lot, machine learning model look beautiful in the lab when you develop it, when you deploy it, crumble. That's very common because machine learning are overfit. Hopefully yeah. not. I, I, hope I can guarantee, I can guarantee you. <laughs> but I wrote the paper on this. You can always do where it's not for when you take points and you go off the edges, you call it like Right. So it's not a goal. The other thing I just want to add, though, is I think, you know, we always try to emphasize that materiality should really play a big role in all of this. So if you're using 
a large language model or some other type of gen AI for very important things in your organization, uh, you likely, you know, you really should um, do a lot of things, you know, that Agus described or, or that I ticked off, you know, strong data governance, lots of testing, careful ongoing monitoring, likely at higher frequency and with um, additional assessments and checking for consistency and so forth. But um, by the same token, if it's something that's used uh, at a very low level in the organization, importantly, though, you do want to check, even if it's individuals using it for something that's low risk, if there are thousands of individuals in the organization using it and it's making the same error for them or the error in the same direction, then that could propagate um, the risk. But, you know, the example I like to use is, um, you know, Gen AI enabled search engines, right? So we're all using those today. Um, if it gives me a wrong answer, um, it's all how I use it, right? If I take it at face value and say, oh my gosh, this is the answer and I'm, this is, you know, I'm gonna run with this and not apply any scrutiny, um, I think that's a real concern. But I think it's, it's very important to remember that with these Gen AI approaches, there is a significant principal agent problem, is the way I like to put it, sort of in the economics profession, and it's often hard to detect. So one big advantage though we have in this Gen AI space that we don't have in the traditional econometric space is to build the econometric models, we spent a lot of time and a lot of money. There is a proliferation of available LLMs today. So I think one of the best ways to test an LLM is just to pull in to ask the same answer against three, four, five, LLMs that are all accessible, all built by different companies, all trained off of different data and cross validate if those answers coincide with each other. You can't do that in, for a lot of the traditional models because you had one. Spent a lot of time and money building that one, so you had to come up with all these other ways to test it. But I think the cross-validation, we, you know, I, I think that's a, a pretty easy approach to, to validating the output of the LLM. Yeah, that's, I, I would say, consistent with principles from general modeling, that if you have models that have a higher degree of uncertainty um, or, or you don't have, uh, you have challenges in assessing performance or you don't have data against which to test performance, you likely try and triangulate around the issue. Mm -hmm. um, and we've seen that, say, for example, in stress testing models. And um, before we move on to the question, I, I, you know, something that came up in the conversation that is very interesting to me, especially coming from the operational risk world, modeling world originally, uh, for those of you who were around in the mid 2000s all the way to the early 2010s when we were building AMA models the the, the anathema to AMA models was overfitting mo models with too many parameters so we were constantly uh, rating banks who were trying to use model uh, distributions with too many parameters we were trying to limit it to two up to five maybe uh, some trying to do kernel estimations and we were completely against it. And, and the reason was very simple is that if, if you overfit your data when the objective is to do out of sample projection, pr predictions, yeah, if you use techniques that overfit, by definition, you're not going to be achieving your objective. And, and the reason I'm bringing that up is that th there is another element here in model risk management, which is not waiting for the model to be built and validate it, <laughs> yeah. but also ensure that there is, you know, a good understanding of when certain tools can and cannot be used. Because these tools are, as you mentioned, very easy to access now. And people might be tempted to, oh, I'll use the tool in a scenario that is absolutely not the right scenario, right? And, and I've seen that happen where, every, you know, it's a sexy thing to do. We're gonna build an ML model now and your data set is still very limited and you're trying to do uh, projections that are way outside of the, the, the range of the, uh, you know, the data that you have to calibrate your model. You, you need structural models for that. You need strong assumptions that are clear and understandable to be made so that you can make these out of sample projections. And if you're gonna use a, 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 a tool that by design is overfitting, it, you're gonna fail. And I think that is one of the dangers is that everyone wants to use the latest 
sexy thing when in some instances it, it just should not be used. Uh, and that's education. But with that, uh, you had a question. Yeah, um, I have a technical question again as a follow-up to the autoregressive models Agus you mentioned about. Um, so Jan Lacoon gave a talk and he said that the LLMs really suck because they are autoregressive, right? Like autoregressive models have like exponential divergence as you kind of move longer. And what he kind of suggests is moving to a lower representation state. Uh, and he suggests like an architecture called JEPA, Joint Embedding Predictive Architecture, where he says, don't use all the information, but filter it down to a representation state, which is more refined than the embeddings. Um, is, are the banks thinking about that transition, which he's talking about, you know, using the energy systems, energy models from the physical systems and whatnot? Is this being considered in the banks or no? Uh, I, I think there is research and then the real world, right? Mm -hmm. So coming from research to real world take a long, long time, right? So uh, any, a lot of ideas in that, uh, when I used to design engine, I used to design engine for motor company. We have research group, after research group, we'll go to advanced engineering group, and from advanced engineering group, then come to my group that's doing production, design engine for today. So modeling is something like that too. Which one is ready for today use? Understanding the limitation, but it's still useful. I think that's what the, uh, the, the game that we have to do today. These models are incredible. They are very useful if we use it right, but we need to understand the beast and how to control it. Now, the problem that I have is because you're talking about now become easy. You just download from Hugging Face or use API, you, you're there. The problem, the danger is this. This is becoming now a technology domain, technology project. Then people think that technologies can do moonlighting to become data scientists, can deploy this. This is the responsibility of people in this room. This is not technology game. This is a model risk management game. So I think this is very, very important and because it carry a lot of model risk and not just technology, just like software. And by the way, it's a problem that existed at a smaller scale in the past with Excel, right? Excel was the first tool to make modeling it more accessible. And I, I've seen that, I'm sure you've mm -hmm. seen it in your bank, uh, a number of people who are literally building models without realizing they're building models. And so it's not in the inventory and they're using it. We had traders do that and they're using it for decision-making and no one validated it. Uh, and it, it, there come and not understanding that Excel has its own limitations. Yes, absolutely, uh, or that the regression tool—you know—it's a simple linear regression, and you—you know—it it has its own flaws. So it, it's very interesting because this is, speaks to the education that needs to happen, right? That model risk is not just there as a cop trying to, <laughs> at the end, validate things and say yeah or nay. Model risk really should take it upon itself to help the change the culture of the bank and help educate the bank as to what is a model, what are the processes, and by the way, make them streamlined enough for the, you know, the appropriate, uh, in the appropriate context so that people are not afraid to bring their model through the process because you, know, you were talking about arbitrage and I, we've seen that where everything, there's a one size fits all tool, a model validation process and then a number of people are afraid of, of uh, declaring a model because they're afraid mm -hmm. of the cost. And so that's on us to make sure we streamline it so that when the risk is low, we can mm -hmm. encourage people to still bring it and not be fearful that we're mm -hmm. going to, uh, uh, to make them lose a lot of time doing it. But education is key. Can I see I a question. Can I actually chime in on that one though? Yes. Um, as a model builder, LLMs are built to be creative. From the core, they're built to be trained off of data and give you something similar, but not exactly what it's seen. Why are we killing the creativity? That could just be the wrong use case for that model. If we feel like we need to strip so much out and contain so much, there could just be another approach. Like I, we're really restrictive with where we use LLM. There's other natural language processing models out there. BERT is a fantastic one that 
all of us who have been here pre LLMs are still using. So like in my head, if we're stripping that much out of an LLM, I would question the use case as opposed to the model. Uh, this is okay. Let, let's take the question and then I will steal 30 seconds because I do have a final question for everyone. All right. But, this might be related to the question, but I, I agree, Agus, that the principles still apply to uh, GPT models or Gen AI. But I wonder if the scale of the problem like makes you have to create a new paradigm. Like how do you do sensitivity analysis when there's like an infinite range of, of uh, uh, inputs? Yeah. Yeah. That you can test, or how do you do perturbation right. when there's an infinite range of perturbation? This is this is very, very important question. Uh, if we do open-ended Q&A, like OpenAI, I think you shoot yourself on the foot. For us in banking, you will never do anything like that because anything can go wrong and people can make it wrong. But if we bound it, what is the use of the model? Because we always do that. We use model for a specific purpose. Then we bound the input and we bound the output, just like in REC, retrieval augmentation region. We bound it. If we bound it, then we can do very extensive testing because we can see, okay, what are the documents that we're going to retrieve? Mm. We can look the embedding, we can cluster it, we can see it. So we can bound it unless you bound it. I think it's only company that crazy enough to unbound it, putting Q and A open ended like uh, like like uh, like open AI. That Lanchimana is the problem because you will never be able to 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 see it because if you unbound it. But this is very very important. If you care about risk in some area, care about risk, then you have to bound it. You have to control it. Otherwise, you're going to shoot yourself on the foot. Unless you're doing something that's not very risky, then yeah, it's okay. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say, unless you're using it in a capacity that is really low risk, and so if there's just this wide range of uncertainty around it or it has the potential to go off the rails, the consequences are not going to be very high. And let me just squeeze in one of my favorite anecdotes on this. Uh, there was actually uh, a group uh, here in New York, the New York Mycological Association. So mycology is the study of mushrooms. And they actually sent out an alert saying, do not purchase any guidebooks on mushrooms that were generated or produced by generative AI because they can be uh, harmful or even deadly mushrooms. They can, they can yourself. make you misclassify things. And so I thought, well, that's pretty high materiality. But I especially love this story because it definitely puts a new twist on the term hallucination. <laughs> I like that, David. Good one. OK, and with that, we're a bit past our time. so. Uh, we'll have to um, cut it short here. I, we had a few more questions, but over coffee. And uh, we, I'll, I'll be around, so if people want to. I, yeah, same we'll here, and uh, more than happy to answer any other questions you might have. And with this, we're going to please stay seated. We're going to transition directly to the next panel. Thank you very much.